This is why you should come to SALT. To study the Bible like you have never studied before. To build your character. To make lasting friendships. To transform your life. To what we hear for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Just look at the times that we're living in. God is searching for an army of young people to take the gospel to the whole world. Will you be part of that army today? Hi everyone. I'd like to invite you to our daily AOY United prayer from 6.15 a.m to 6.55 a.m. for the Chinese session and 7 a.m. to 7.40 a.m. for the English session at Malaysian time. We have come to serious times which calls for serious prayers. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. 
we acknowledge that we need the Holy Spirit and this can be made a reality through united prayer. God will do things for us when we pray that He will not do if we do not pray. We must all learn the power of prayer. Great things will happen in and among God's people and throughout the world if His people will come unitedly to pray. In our daily united prayer, we will pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit together. So come and join us in our daily united prayer, the most sacred and blessed time of the day. See you there! Musicverse is a digital platform where Adventist believers can listen to pure and sanctified sacred music and learn how to sing or play a musical instrument in a godly way. Musicverse does that by gathering committed Seventh-day Adventist artists, allowing them to share their work and musical expertise with the global Adventist audience through its platform. Every time young people are revived or new members are baptized into our church, it has always been a struggle to point them to a safe space where they can find godly music that they can be assured is both sacred and safe. It is also a challenge to browse through thousands of songs on Spotify or on YouTube to hunt for godly musicians and songs. Even in the Christian world, which contemporary Christian artists are actually safe to listen to? and which are not. The Worldwide Adventist Movement is over 20 million members today, but it can be hard for me as an Adventist musician to reach the audience without a global platform. Adventists in different regions usually only know of the artist within their country, or at most one or two other famous musicians. I'm glad to know that one of the goals of Musicverse is to connect me with Adventists all over the globe so that we can share and change the lives with the music God has blessed us with. This is why I really do what I do. My daughter is nine years old, and I remember when she first started learning violin, we couldn't find any Adventist teachers in our area, so we had to get a secular violin teacher. According to her, the best way to start learning is with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and other secular songs. I wish we could have found an Adventist teacher, even virtually through the internet, who could teach my daughter using scripture songs or sacred music. Growing up, I have dreamed about being a professional musician who could bless others through my music. As a young, aspiring Adventist musician, I never imagined that there would be an opportunity for me to impact the world through composing music for scripture songs, to help thousands of Seventh-day Adventists all around the world hide the Word of God in their hearts. Music Verse has made this possible. We are living in dangerous and deceptive times where Satan is using even so-called Christian music to draw people away from their relationship with God. That's why I'm glad that Music Verse have a music review team that will ensure that the music you listen to there will be safe, holy and sanctified. Since 2014, by God's grace, we started a Bible school here in Malaysia called SALT. And every year we get about 20 to 30 students and about one third of them will go into Bible work. I praise God that Music Verse has a mission focus and that all profits will go towards supporting Bible work here and eventually other parts of Asia. So not only will you be able to listen to godly music, but each dollar that you spend, a portion of that will go towards supporting mission work in some part of the world. If you want a place to listen to godly, sanctified music without being tempted. If you're an Adventist musician and you want to reach the global Adventist population. If you're a parent and you want your child to learn music using sacred songs. If you're an aspiring musician and want to impact Adventists all around the world. If you want to be assured that the music you're listening to is safe. Or if you want to support missionaries every time you buy songs. Support Music Verse and download the app today.
Welcome once again, brothers and sisters from all over the world. I'm glad that you are tuned in to join us in our evening session. I hope that all of you have been having a wonderful and blessed Sabbath. Uh, I just want to make an announcement about our testimony. Uh, I hope that you are all had a great time this afternoon hearing testimonies. But aside from that, I hope that I want to encourage each and every one of you to share your testimony if you have. I'm sure there are some of you who have experience and a testimony to share and you are holding back. And I want to encourage you to share. You know, the, uh, the spirit of prophecy tells us that the greatest miracle in the book Evangelism, page 289, paragraph 2, it says, the conversion of a human soul is of no little consequences. It is the greatest, it says, it is the greatest miracle performed by divine power. You might think that uh, parting the Red Sea was a great miracle. It, it, indeed, it was a great miracle. But it further tells us that your life changing, your experience that God, that you have with God and you transforming to, to, to from uh, ungodly to godly, the Ellen White tells us that that is the greatest miracle. And I don't want you to hide it. If you're holding back, I'm telling you to share it, to write it. And I hope you share it by uh, true sh social media or even email to us. So if you're posting it in social media, uh, hashtag AOY, capital letter AOY, hashtag AOY, 2021 online, all right? Instagram, Facebook, wherever you are, hashtag that, okay? Or if you're going to email, email your testimony and your experience to prayerteam at aoyweb.org. I see, I repeat that again, prayerteam at aoyweb.org. Share your testimony. Don't hold it back. Someone might need that inspiration. Okay. I also want to uh, take this time to pray before I pass my time to uh, Brother Christopher Cram. I want to pray with all of you. Uh, we also want to pray, you know, during this pandemic to maybe some of you out there have lost your loved ones through this virus. We want to pray for them and the families. Uh, for maybe we have brothers and sisters among our church that have, uh, uh, what's this, have been attacked by this virus. Uh, we want to pray for their healing, uh, healing as well. So I pray uh, as, we, as we come now together as a, as a family and a, as a body of Christ, I want you to silently pray for them as well and also remind them uh, in your daily, and not just today, but uh, as the week goes by. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are gathered together again to come into your presence, to hear your word, to study, to be revived. Lord, I want to pray for all of us to be Christian soldiers, ready, O oh Lord, to go in your name to win souls. Lord, I want to pray especially for those who have been fighting with this virus. I pray, O oh Lord, that your healing hands, that same hands that have created them, will be that hand that healed them. Furthermore, Lord, I pray not just for their physical healing, but far greater, Lord, I pray for their spiritual healing, that their salvation is secured. Lord, I want to pray, O oh Lord, for uh, Brother Christopher Cram, as he will share your word. I pray that you anoint his lips. For the rest of us who are listening, I pray, O oh Lord, that we remove all distraction and may we pay attention to what you are about to share to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This moment, I'd like to pass the time to Brother Christopher. The time is yours. Can you hear me good? Loud and clear, yes. Thank you so much. Welcome back to our second session together. I, I want to once again express my gratitude for the organizers of AOY for inviting me through this uh, special technology called Zoom. Um, to be honest, I even liked it more when I was in Malaysia uh, back in the day. Uh, I told you yesterday already how much I love the country and especially the people living in the country. And um, anyway, um, I want to apologize um, because uh, I guess my sermon yesterday was a bit too long. Uh, I kind of forgot that you are six hours behind me. No, 
forward, you know, six hours later than me. Um, so it was quite late for you to, to uh, yesterday evening. So I hope you you still catch uh, caught enough sleep. And uh, by God's grace, uh, we are going to be not uh, so long uh, for this evening talk, which really is for me an early afternoon talk. As a matter of fact, it's not even 2 p.m. Here in Germany, I actually arrived uh, from another sermon that I preached at a local church uh, for divine service. And um, before that sermon started, a sister uh, told a children's story about a female missionary to China and um, how that uh, missionary went to China and all her experiences there. And uh, of course, my, my mind wandered uh, in that direction and I couldn't help but greet the German local church here with a few words I still remember from my time in Malaysia, happy Sabbath in Chinese. And if I'm not mistaken, it sounds some, something like this, An chi le kwai la. So if that sounds terrible for you, you need to invite me back to Malaysia so that I can once again have the opportunity to um, practice that. But I hope that, I guess maybe the Sabbath is already over uh, at your time. I hope that your Sabbath was blessed in a special way. But as we know, God's blessing never really stops. Even if Sabbath turns to Sunday, God's presence and his spirit is always with us. And um, as we're now going to prepare our hearts to open our minds for the spirit to speak personally to us, I would like to invite you, if uh, that is possible at all for you, wherever you are, um, if it's possible that we would kneel down for a short word of prayer, and then we will open our Bible and um, study God's word. Let's kneel down and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the opportunity once again to study your word and to be connected through technology. We are on different parts of the world, but we're all connected through your Holy Spirit. And what a blessing it is to have brothers and sisters all over the world that are looking to Jesus, loving God with all their hearts and are willing to hasten his coming, empowered by the Spirit. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will now fill our minds that we may gain a fresh sight of your character and that we may be enabled and equipped to go forth to let the world know that you are a good God and that you are doing the very best for us. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles at first to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, of course, is the basis for this year's theme of the conference AOI, looking unto Jesus. The entire passage in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, reads thus. Reading Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Remember that idea. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yesterday, we studied someone that made it his habit to look unto Jesus. We studied the life of John from the beginning 
till the end. And we saw there's one main motive, one idea that runs like a red thread through his entire life. And that is always looking to Jesus, coming closer to his divine friend, nearer, still nearer. And we saw that by simply always looking for more friendship with Jesus, looking for more contact with him, by looking unto Jesus, our character can be fully changed. Now, in this passage, it is very clear that when we look to Jesus, we look to him that has died for us. It, is, it says clearly, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, which means he started our faith journey, and he, by his grace and power, will bring it to a glorious end if we hold fast to him. Why? Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We know that we can only reach the finish line because Jesus died for us. And the reason why he died for us is clearly spelled out, out in this verse. It says, for the joy that was set before him. In other words, while Jesus was approaching the shadow of the cross, while he was actually hanging at the cross, he looked to something. He saw something that was set before him. That was not something literal because when he was hanging on the cross, there was little joy at that moment. But somehow Jesus, even hanging on the cross, he was looking at something. While we are invited to look unto Jesus, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, lets us know that while we look to Jesus, Jesus looked to something. And because he looked to that joy, he was willing to stay at the cross. He was willing to fulfill the plan. He could have gone into heaven before that. He could have said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going further with this. But he remained faithful until the end because he saw something. And when we study what he saw and how this helped him to stay on the path that God had for him, I believe we will be enabled also by looking unto Jesus to stay faithful on the path that God has for us. What was Jesus looking at? This question, I believe, is answered when we consider another question, a question that I believe has not received the attention it should have in our minds, in our midst, in our churches. And that question is, what is God's greatest desire? Most likely, God has a lot of things that he wishes, a lot of things that he desires. But what is his greatest desire? You may ask the question, is it even possible to know? Because sure enough, we might have some very good answers just popping into our minds, but this Session, I want to um, encourage you to think a little bit more deeply. What is actually God thinking? What is his top priority on the great list of his agenda? Can we actually know what God thinks? I ask the question on purpose because we may clearly say, oh, of course, God talks to me. He speaks in the Bible. Yes, I know what he thinks. But we should be a little bit more cautious because the Bible says in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 55, reading verse 9, we can read verse 8, sorry. In Isaiah chapter 55, reading verse 8 and 9, here, God himself is revealing something to us, saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. And 
just in case we would think, okay, maybe he has some more thoughts than, than, than we, and he has a little more ways, and there's just a little difference. He tries to illustrate the massive gap between his thoughts and our thoughts. Reading in verse 9, it goes on to say, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, in case you, are, you have a window in your room or you're sitting in the car right now, just look outside and look at the horizon, look at the, at, at the earth and look at heaven, look at the clouds if there's some in the, in the sky and ponder the massive gap between heaven and earth. God says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts then your thoughts. God is trying to communicate to us. There are thoughts that he has we can never grasp. It is not like God, God has some thoughts and he just reveals them to us and we know all that God thinks. God has this problem, if I'm allowed to define it like this. He has this problem that he thinks things that we will never fully grasp. Have you ever seen someone in church telling a children's story, trying to bring a very profound theological idea down to the level of children that are three or four or five years old? Somehow I believe God is having the same problem, how he can explain thoughts that he has, ideas and wishes, a desire that is so broad as the universe to human beings that are so finite and so narrow. But sure enough, someone knows what God thinks. Even if we, by all our intellect and all our searching and all our wisdom, we never even come close to what God really thinks. The Bible says someone knows. Someone knows what God thinks. The Bible clearly says in Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah 29, this is also a very famous passage. God himself says, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, even if you cannot fully grasp what I desire, I know exactly what I want. God is not confused about what he really wants. God is not vague in his own mind. He doesn't stop and think like, what do I really want? Sometimes we in our life, we don't know what we actually want, right? Sometimes we have the pr problem that we want things that we, do know, that we do know are not good for us, but sometimes we don't even know what to, what to desire. But God says, I don't have this problem. I know exactly what I want. I know exactly what I think. And God is trying everything he can to make these thoughts known to us in a way that we weak, narrow-minded human beings are able to grasp at least the core of it. God has used many prophets, many parables, prophecies, stories, songs, songs, proverbs, illustrations, typologies, to express something of the length and breadth of what he really wants. One of the most remarkable passages that I believe is far underestimated, even in our church, is found in Jeremiah chapter 32. It's one of my favorite Bible verses, Bible passages that I have found over the last years. In Jeremiah chapter 39, verse, oh, we can read from verse 38. Jeremiah <clears throat> 39, reading from verse 38, the Bible says, they shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I give, <clears throat> excuse me, then I will give them one heart and one way 
that they may fear me forever. Keep that in the back of your mind. We're coming to this. For the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will assuredly plan them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Question, do these, verse, these words with all my heart and with all my soul, do they actually remind you of other verses in the Bible? Most likely you also think of these verses that my mind immediately runs to. Verses like, you should love your God with all your heart and with all your mind, and with all your soul. These famous words from Deuteronomy chapter 6, repeated by Jesus and called the great commandment, the greatest of all. We have frequently been told that God wants that we should love him with all our hearts, with all our minds, and with all our strength. But in this passage, it is not about our love and our hearts and our mind and all our strength. It is about what God wants with all his heart and with all his strength. What we just read is the number one priority on his busy universe schedule. If we would ask God, what's the one thing that is upmost in your mind? The one thing that you think the most about? He would say, the thing that I desire with all my heart and with all my mind is to do you good and to plan you and to rejoice over you and to, and to plant you in a way that you will not leave me. Have you read this in verse 40? But I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. God's greatest desire is that we stay with him so that he can bless us with all the blessing that only God himself can imagine and create. These are not only words. If we go to another prophet, again to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter five, we see that God not only says that he wants to do us good with all his heart and with all his mind and with all his soul and strength and everything he has, we find in Isaiah five that he testifies that he actually has done this over and over again. In Isaiah chapter five, In Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, we are reading from verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest wine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it, not, but it brought forth wild grapes. Isaiah is singing a, a prophetic song about his well-beloved friend, about God. And we know when we read further that this vineyard is a symbol for the people of Israel, the church of the Old Testament times. And Isaiah in the songs describes how much God has done for his people. And then in verse 3, the perspective changes. It's not longer Isaiah singing about God. It's God speaking himself to his people Israel. We read from verse 3, where it says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. And now listen to this question. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, 
did it bring forth wild grapes? God is asking an almost desperate question. He asked, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I, that is the almighty God, have not done this? Questions like this are called rhetorical question because God is not confused. God wants to make the point that he did everything that an infinite God could actually think of. God asked his people, tell me if there's any blessing I could have given you that I purposefully withhold. If there's anything I could have done better, tell me. He did all he can. He blessed Israel with all his mind and all his soul and all his strength. He planted them in the land of Israel. And the Bible says they brought wild grapes. Now let me ask you a question. You know that wild grapes here is a symbol that they did not believe in God as he thought they could do. He, they did not follow his ways. They sinned against him terribly. And I want to ask you the question, did God know this beforehand? Did God know when he put all his mind and all his soul and all his strength into planting Israel, did he know in advance that they would finally apostatize and run after other gods? Did he know that? And the question, of course, is yes. Then the Bible frequently tells us that God is not surprised by events. God knows the future before it happens. That's why he can give prophecy. The Bible is full of evidence that God knows in advance what would happen. And now I ask you the question, have you ever seen a gardener? Or let me rephrase the question. If you personally for one moment would be gifted with the gift of foreknowledge, just say for, for a moment that for a short time you would be able to look into the future and know what will happen next day, next week, next month, next year. And let's say you are a gardener. Let's say you have a garden or a field and you know already because of prophecy, you know because you know the future, you know that this garden will not, not have any good fruit. How much work would you put into a garden? that you know in advance will not produce the fruit that you desire. A few weeks ago, I was preaching via Zoom once again at an agriculture conference. And uh, not because I'm an expert in agriculture, I'm not. The only thing I can actually do from agriculture is I can eat the fruit. My wife is a very good um, expert in agriculture. Uh, but anyway, when I asked them, professional agricultural, professional farmers. Who of you is putting all his mind, all his strength, all his soul into a field that he knows already will not yield any good fruits? And they all left. But then they understood. This is what God was doing. And that's not the only instance where God was putting all that he had into human beings, knowing beforehand they would eventually fall. Remember when the temple was built by Solomon? Remember how the people came together, how they praised God and how Solomon prayed and an impressive prayer to God? Remember how they all were united and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and pledged themselves to be faithful to God? Did God know at that, that celebration, did God know already that they would leave him? Did he know already when the temple of Solomon was dedicated, did he know already that this temple would be burned 
to the ground by the Babylonians? Yes, he knew. But still, he blessed them at that moment. And not just a little bit, he blessed them mightily. He blessed Solomon and he blessed the people beyond measure so that even the other nations were amazed about the blessing that God gave. Go with me a few centuries back in time and see the Israelites just coming out of the Red Sea and the Red Sea when the last Israelite came out, going back to its original place and burying all the Egyptian army beneath the water masses. And here the Israelites sing the song to God of glory and praise the Lord and amen. And he's a mighty warrior. All Israelites were believers in God at that moment. They all were happy and they were singing hallelujah that God had redeemed them and had saved them from an aggressive enemy. But when God heard the singing of Moses and the people, when he saw the joyful tune played by Miriam and others, when he heard and, and saw this, did he know that the very same people, almost every one of them would die in the desert? Did he know that? Yes, he, know. he knew. He knew that many of them, almost every one of them, month later, would not even believe that God is good. And they would say that God hated them. But still God blessed them on their way. He gave them manna, the, the food of angels on a daily or almost daily basis. He gave them water out of the rock. He went with them personally in the pillar of fire and the pillar of clouds. He blessed the Israelites knowing that most of them would still be lost. Go with me back even more centuries back in time to the first Sabbath day. They were so blessed that the entire world population, consisting of two people, together with all the angels, the heavenly host, the, 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 the unfallen worlds, praised God, the almighty creator, with shouts of gladness and songs of happiness. I do not know, but... I imagine that if someone could have pierced the inapproachable light in which God the Father is enshrouded, while the songs and the praises and the hallelujahs were ringing through the universe, that if it would have been possible to pierce that light, you could have seen God the Father having tears in his eyes, tears maybe running down his cheeks because he knew that this planet would rebel and that most human beings that would exist for the next 6,000 and so years would finally be lost. And still God did not only something for this planet. He didn't say, oh, I know already it will fail. Therefore, I just make it, you know, just ordinary. No, he made it as good as possible. He made the world as beautiful and as perfect as God himself can do it. The testimony is clear. He made it very good. Now, if you think about this, you realize that God does not bless us because we have qualified for that. God does not love us because we have been obedient. He, if God is able and willing to put 
everything into a people that he knows beforehand will apostatize. If God is willing to put all his creativity and perfection into a world that he knows will go crazy, then it's very clear that his love and his desire to bless you and me is not conditional. In fact, he blesses many people that never will receive the full blessing. There is more blessing given out by God than blessing received by the people. Never has someone asked for blessing and not received it. It's the other way around. There are many blessings that God wanted us to have that will never be realized. Let me ask you a question. Once again, we just imagine for one moment that we have the gift the gift of knowing the future. And imagine you're at your workplace, wherever you work, and a new team member, a new colleague, a new person that will work at your workplace is introduced to the team. And you know by looking to the future that that person will be responsible for ruining your family. This person will be responsible for causing a split in your family that will never be healed. Let me ask you the question. How would you relate to that person knowing that in the future that person will cause you so much harm and grief? How would you relate? I can tell you from the Bible how God related to such a person. In Isaiah, not Isaiah, Ezekiel, of course, sorry. In Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28, the Bible in a well-known passage that we sometimes not really think through, at least in this context, in Ezekiel 28, verse 16, <clears throat> verse 12, sorry, in, or we can read from 11. Ezekiel 28 from 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. He made Lucifer wiser than anyone else, more beautiful than anyone else. He blessed this person, Lucifer, truly with all his heart and all his soul and all his strength. He gave everything to him. He made him an anointed cherub. This Lucifer was wiser than everyone else. In fact, when he was wiser than everyone else, he was more capable to understand God. Because as we saw, God's thoughts are almost, uh, not almost, we cannot fully grasp God's thoughts. Even Lucifer could not fully grasp God's thoughts. But of all the angels, he could understand the most compared to others. Maybe it was like this. Sometimes when God created the world and he explained to the angels what he did, and then the angels would say, Ooh, that's really, that's, that's deep. We don't, really, we don't even get it. We don't understand how does this work. Maybe then Lucifer said, I understand. I, I caught this. Have, have you ever met people that uh, understand what you're saying? That, um, that almost can read your mind? People that when you say something, they don't ask six times again, but I know exactly what you mean. Normally, if we meet such people, 
we feel very close to them. If we meet such people, they become often good friends because they can understand us. And so God made this being one of his closest friends, so close that he would stand all the time next to him, looking into the law of God, which is the heart of God, because the law of God in the Ark of the Covenant, which is the basis of his throne, this law of God is his character. So those that were enabled, those that were privileged to look into the Ark of the Covenant, it was almost as if God would open up his heart and say, this is how I feel in the most inner soul of my own being. Lucifer was, I believe, one of his closest friends. He made the man, the angel that he, that he knew would one day be his greatest enemy, his closest friend. And this tells us that God's love is not conditional. This tells us that God does not love us in order to gain something. He does not become our friend in order that we just serve him and he gets the gain. His greatest desire is not to see how he gains something and how he can be exalted. His greatest desire is true friendship. The Bible says, in 1st Corinthians. In a well-known passage, and you see we're just reading well-known passages. And I hope the Spirit of God touches our hearts to see with new eyes what we have read so often. The Bible says in 1st Corinthians 13, reading from verse 4, well known, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked is not provoked, thinks no evil, and does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This love of God is so incomprehensible to us that God says, I knew Israel was apo would apostatize, but I blessed them so much, I still hoped for good fruits. This <clears throat> is too much for my mind to fully grasp. But I can believe it. I can see that God is saying this and I can see in my own life that God is trying to bless me more than I just received in my life so far because sin often blocks the way. God loves us in a way that goes far beyond our comprehension. He wants us to see that his love does not seek his own. If we today could go into the throne room of God personally and ask him, what is your greatest desire? Is your greatest desire to expose the wickedness of evil men? God would say, that's important, but that's not my greatest desire. It's your greatest desire that human beings know doctrinal truth about you. He would say it's important that they know doctrinal truth because that's how they understand me better. But that's not my greatest desire. If you would ask the question, is your greatest desire that your name may be exalted? He would say, yes, that will be um, an outcome of the great controversy, but that's not my greatest desire because love does not seek its own. His greatest desire is truly not looking unto himself. His greatest desire is he is looking unto you and unto me and asking himself the question, how can I bless that human being even more? And it paints him in a, war, in, in a way that we cannot even grasp, that we so often don't believe him. It paints him that people that he has blessed beyond measure left him. Lucifer, blessed beyond everything, left him. Israel, the chosen people of God, too often they left him. What is God's greatest desire? His greatest desire is 
since he with all his heart and all his mind wants to bless us. His greatest desire is for someone not only to come to him, but to stay with him so that he can bless and bless and bless and bless. That's exactly what he said in our passage in Jeremiah 32. My friends, I have seen too many people being enthused and enthusiastic about the gospel, going out even on missionary trips, and then later leave the church and leave Jesus. God's greatest desire is not that people would come to him. His greatest desire is that people would stay with him. Because these people will be safe to take to heaven. As we, as we read in Jeremiah 32, he said, Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Not just for one Sabbath, not just for one AOY conference for two weeks, and then it's all gone again. He wants to have us stay with him for the good of them and their children after them, and I will make an everlasting covenant. Time will not permit, but you may know that Abraham made a covenant with God, or better, God made a covenant with Abraham several times. And one time, God came to Abraham and said, you know, we have a covenant and therefore I will make a covenant with you. You can read that in, in, in Genesis 17. And that's quite remarkable because he clearly says, we have already covenant and we know that God made the covenants already with Abraham, like in, in, in Genesis 15, where they even cut the animals. There was a clear covenant, but God says, I want to make a covenant again. Why? Because Abraham did not stay in the covenant. Yes, he believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. But then he, he thought to himself, maybe God is not really doing the very best he can. And I need to take life in my own hands. Because, you know, it is whenever we believe that God is not blessing us with all his mind and all his soul. If we don't believe that God is giving the best, then it's that we think that there might be another option, a, a better way than God's way. And that's how sin approaches us. And this is how sin... Um, it, actually, I believe, originated in, in Lucio when he started to think that may, there may be something that is better than what God is doing for him. Then he started to sin. This is what he told Eve when he said, God knows it's good for you, but he hasn't told you, right? There's something that is good for you. You will become like God, but God seemingly hasn't told you. So the, which means that God, in, according to his view, is not giving you the best. He may be good. He may be very good, but he's not doing the best for you. And therefore, in some instance, he's, he, he suggested you need to take your life in your own hands. Whenever we believe that, sin will definitely follow. And so God's greatest desire is to show us not only that we say God is love and yes of course but that we truly try to grasp this idea that god in heaven is doing the very best god himself is able to do to bless us and that there cannot be a better way to live life than the way that god is suggesting because he knows us better than we ourselves and he knows the future and his greatest desire number one priority is to bless us and so God told Abraham, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. That's what he and Jeremiah once again is proposed. Not a covenant, but a covenant for eternity. My friends, God is not looking for someone to get baptized and then to leave the church 10 years later. God is not looking for someone to be enthusiastic after attending a Bible school and then later not doing anything because he has left or she has left the faith. God is not looking for someone who, who comes to AOY and listens to all sermons for, and then later to forget everything. God is looking for people that will Stay with him. Those that would stay until the very end, those that endure unto the end, they will be saved. In closing, I think sin has so much, so much blinded our perceptions. 
that even if you're good Christians and well-versed Adventists, it's sometimes really difficult for us to fully grasp this idea that God values friendship in it of itself. Not because he wants to gain something by the friendship, because if God made Lucifer one of his best friends, then it's very clear God is not taking advantage of friendship. He just wants friendship because friendship itself is a blessing to God. Listen to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, the Bible says, reading verse 15. John 15, verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. You know, I'm sure you all have good friends, maybe a best friend. And you know, it's to a best friend that you open up the secrets. You don't tell your inner life to it, every person on the planet, but it's to a special treasured friend that you tell the things that are on your heart. You know that God is telling you and me what is on his heart. He's revealing secrets to us through prophecy. Every prophecy that opens to your understanding is an evidence that God sees you as his trusted friend because he shows you something of his secret. Every word that the Bible speaks to us tells us that God sees us as our friend because he wants to communicate with us. He wants to see us, that he loves us. You know that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus died for us, not because we merited it, not because we qualified by obedience, as a matter of fact, if you, if you leave your finger in John 15, we're coming there in just a moment back, and we quickly go to Romans 5, also well known. In Romans chapter 5, and we read verse 8. Romans 5 verse 8, the Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And what does it mean to be a sinner? The Bible clearly identifies that and defines it in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Bible says when Jesus died for you and me, we were enemies. And now I'll go back to John 15. And listen and read with me verse 13. Jesus, that very Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. My friends, when Jesus looked down from heaven and he saw his enemies he looked and he saw friends he saw the potential of friendship we are exhorted to look unto jesus but why why does god say that we should look unto jesus it is precisely because jesus first looked at me and looked at you and although we were unworthy sinners and we were enemies and we rebelled against god and 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 harmed his creation and harmed his creatures and harmed the the beings that he has created he still wanted my the friendship of me and the friendship of you and do you know how much he gave for that friendship the one that blessed Israel beyond measure, the one that guided Israel through the desert, but what, the one that made this world knowing it would fall so perfect as possible, the one that created Lucifer as the most perfect 
angel ever created. The same gave everything that heaven could give. Jesus became man, died on the cross. He gave himself to tell you and me, I want to be your friend. And if Jesus is willing to give all, because he looked for the joy of being my friend for eternity, then we can look unto Jesus, believing that he will do everything in his power. And he says, us, says to us that all power is given him in heaven and on in earth. Then he will do everything within his power to help me on that way, to change me and to perfect me. I, I can't see you and I can't hear you, but the Holy Spirit can see you. God can see you, Jesus can see you, and they can hear you. And so in their behalf, I want to make a very simple appeal. If this message has pierced your heart, if it has opened up a window so that you can see that this God of the universe wants to be your friend, and this is not only one thing on his agenda, but number one priority, who of you? is willing to say, not tomorrow, not next week, but today, right now in his heart, Lord, I cannot fully grasp what you think about me, but I, I can see it's only the best. And I can see that living the life with you is better than living my life without you. I want to invite you into my life right now, here where I am, and I invite you to stay. I invite you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so much that on a day by day basis, I will stick to you and I will learn to become your trusted friend so that you can take me to heaven, that we can enjoy our friendship forevermore. So every, anyone today here or, or later listening to this recording who wants to make that decision, make it now. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, words are not sufficient to describe the beauty of the gospel and the length and hate of what you planned for us. But fortunately, we don't need to understand everything. It would be impossible, but we can trust you. We can believe you, knowing that you will lead us step by step. And at this moment, I only pray that every searching soul, every honest person that is right now opening her heart, his heart to the influence of your Holy Spirit will make this great experience that you will never forsake them, that you will fill them with the Holy Spirit and that there is a joy in knowing that you are for us and that you want to bless us. That is greater than any joy the world can give. My father, thank you for doing everything you can for reaching our hearts. And although we know that we cannot of our own selves come to you nor stay with you, we, can't, we can give ourselves into your hands so that in you will bring us to you, you will draw us, you will change us, and you will stabilize us so, so that by your grace, we will stay where you are and stay with you forevermore. This is our humble prayer. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus who gave everything for me personally and for everyone that is listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Christopher. Made the, the love of Jesus towards us so much more alive and so much more real. I hope when he made the call to commit, I hope that uh, 
each of you individually have committed that in your heart. I uh, just want to make a short announcement. Tomorrow, our first session will be at 8.30 again in the morning, Malaysian time, for the morning devotion. And then uh, Pastor Samuel Wong will continue to give us the, uh, the message uh, at 10 a.m., en uh, encountering Jesus throughout the Bible. And then uh, at 2 p.m., we have Candice and Carla. And then in the, uh, in the evening, 7.30 p.m., tomorrow, uh, Brother Christopher Graham will give us the final charge, and I'm sure you don't want to miss it. So I hope I will see all of you tomorrow. With that, before I say goodbye and take care, I just want you all to stay back because we have a special video on salt uh, being played. I hope you get to watch it as well. So stay back until the video ends. And uh, God bless, and may you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. AOY SALT is a four-month Bible training program that started as a follow-up to the AOY conference. Over the past eight years, we have had 400 individuals come through SALT, both in person and online. In 2021, because of the pandemic and lockdown, our school was greatly affected. However, we saw God's hand leading, and as we look back, we can count all the blessings we did not expect to receive. Firstly, the Lord led us to have online Zoom classes from January to March this year. Classes were held in the evening for working adults who are normally unable to take time off work to join full-time. Many of these were mothers who otherwise would not have been able to leave their homes and children to attend SALT physically. From these online classes, we saw pockets of revival in local churches all around Malaysia and even all around the world. We saw the start of church prayer groups, care groups, and more teaching in Sabbath school. We knew, however, that the experience of SALT online classes is nowhere near to the in-person experience of the full SALT program. In faith, when Malaysia allowed all schools to reopen, SALT decided to reopen its four-month Bible training school as well. A small class of seven full-time students and two part-time students signed up. A few weeks after SALT started, we saw a sudden increase in COVID cases in Malaysia. Schools closed again, and shortly after, Malaysia went into a third lockdown. Thankfully, however, this year, God led us in such a way that the classroom, the male and female accommodations, the deans, and the teachers were all in the same condominium. God saw into the future for us, and the lockdown barely affected the students. This class of 2021 will finish their four-month training program soon in September. What happens after they are done, you may ask? Ellen White says in Review and Herald, April 28, 1896, paragraph 7, We need men well-trained, well-educated to work in the interests of the churches. Students are given the opportunity to test their calling for the ministry and get further trained in the mission field by giving up one year of their life for Bible work. Let's take a look at what the Bible workers from last year have been doing. These are the students from AOI SALT, Class of 2020. From the Class of 2020, eight students stayed back after SALT for further field training as Bible workers. The Bible workers were assigned to three teams. Each team was assigned a different area and ministry. The first team was assigned to a campus ministry in a local university here in KL. Through a student club, we ran health talks, care groups, exercise groups, and even set up welfare and counseling for students who were heavily affected during the pandemic. In just a few short months, we saw the health message and gospel work hand in hand. Students who were on the brink of suicide decided to turn to God and have Bible studies. We even had a handful of students decide to commit their lives to Christ during this time. To top it all off, the university opened their doors wide, supporting and promoting every event to their students. The second team was assigned to a poor, low-income area in KL. Many of these residents were not even able to afford basic health care. God saw this opportunity, and so, with the right arm of the gospel, we brought the health message and affordable natural remedies to these communities. Many of these residents allowed us to visit their homes regularly. 
and the team brought Bibles and the Gospel together with the natural home remedies and groceries. The residents could not get enough, and soon the team was receiving calls during the lockdown, asking them when they would be able to return and visit them in the homes again. The third team was assigned to a rich and affluent area in KL. The aim of this third team was to plant a church in this area. Once again, we found the health message being the opening wedge to the community. This time, we found that networking, branding, and trust was more important as free health talks and welfare were not the needs of this neighborhood. Again, we met individuals who were searching for the meaning of life and God. We praise God for the many miracles that have been happening with the Bible workers. With such a big team, management and accountability was challenging. Two key ingredients were needed to push the work forward, far and wide. The first ingredient was two hour devotional lives. We required all team members to spend two hours in devotion and prayer every morning, challenging the Bible workers to experience the power of a transformed life. Sure enough, we found that power through the Holy Spirit and our relationship with God instead of how hard we worked and how many events we held. The second ingredient was united prayer. Following a sermon by Pastor David Chin, our churches decided to come together at 6 a.m. every Sunday morning to pray for individuals in the church by name. The church united in prayer for two hours every week. And slowly but surely, we saw people we prayed for being converted and giving their lives for God. The COVID-19 pandemic has not just been a challenge for the gospel work, but it's also been a wake-up call for many of us who slumber in these last days. It is one of the biggest worldwide signs, testifying of the pestilences prophesied to come true in Matthew 24. There will only be more, friends. Salt exists to prepare an army of youth to stand in the last days, to teach the young people and the laity to be soul-winning evangelists in whatever profession they're called to do, and to be leaders in their churches as well. Granted, not all of our SALT students are young in age, and not all are called to be full-time workers in the vineyard, but certainly, God calls each of us to be His witnesses and to be a salt and a light to this world. This is where salt can be a blessing to each of you, even if that is just to strengthen your walk with Jesus and to have a more intimate knowledge of His Word. I know for a fact that God is calling each and every one of you. Do you feel the need to be trained? Do you see your place in the gospel ministry? Do you need to get away and take a break from the rush of this world? For many are called, but few are chosen. My prayer for each of you, friends, today is that you will heed the voice of the Master's call in your life. Luke 10.2 The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest.